And thanks for coming back to the Shifting Schools podcast. I am Trisha Friedman, and on with me today is Fiona Goodall, who is a special educator with over 20 years of experience. Fiona holds a Bachelor of Education and Master of Special Education. She's a certified facilitator of the Peers Program, Peaceful Kids Mindfulness and Positive Psychology Programs, and is a certified facilitator of Lego-based therapy. We are here today to talk a little bit about what it means to sustain a dialogue around AI and to maybe take on a cautiously optimistic mindset. Fiona has worked across all education sectors, including specialist autism settings, special education settings, and mainstream schools, both in Australia and abroad. It's a real pleasure to tap into her expertise on the podcast this week. Before we dive in with our conversation, we do have a quick word from our show sponsor. Discover the power of acknowledgement with Libra. In a world where every staff member's dedication shapes the future, recognizing their efforts becomes our mission. Libra transforms your school into a place where achievements, big and small, are celebrated daily, creating a ripple effect of motivation and pride. Join the recognition revolution with Libra, where every achievement is a cause for celebration. For more information and a free demo, Contact me at jeff at shiftingschools.com today. And now with that, on with the show. Fiona, such a pleasure to be speaking with you. You have a an extensive, long history of learning about the potential for assistive technologies. And I'm really curious how that background and all of that foundational knowledge has kind of positioned you to have really intriguing insight as we are exploring what opportunities might be on the horizon or might already be here with AI. Yeah, so I have been working in all the different education sectors here in Australia, private, independent schools, Catholic education, specialist settings. Um, the last 15 years or so, I've been working in mainstream schools, that's what we call them, and we usually have inclusive departments within those schools. So I was heading up those in the last couple of schools and a large percentage of the students who we were working with had learning differences. That's why they, you know, that's why they were coming to us. Um, lots with reading difficulties um, and difficulties in mathematics as well. In particular, I was I was really interested in in literacy intervention. So we were putting some great evidence based into literacy intervention programs in place, but we were finding that the little people just still couldn't catch up. Yes, we could we could gradually teach them to read it at their pace but we needed compensatory strategies as well otherwise they were just missing the curriculum completely so and you know these young people cognitively were able to understand the curriculum and the, and the discussions and the content but in terms of their literacy weren't able to respond um, in writing or keep up, keep up with the reading you know and that kind of impacts so many other areas as well they weren't accessing you know rich literature that their same age peers were so they weren't developing the vocabulary they weren't hearing all of those different principles of reading so you know really quickly discovered that yes you can you can teach young people to read you know with really systematic, synthetic, phonics-paced interventions, but we still need other ways for them to access the curriculum. So that's where I really became interested in assistive technologies, particularly we, we had some for mathematics, but I just, I guess I'll talk with about literacy. Um, so that was really interesting. So we, I, I was in a, in a prep 
So that's our, our school starts from grade one, goes to grade 12, and our prep is a preparatory grade. So I was in a P to 12 school, and we were actually starting some assistive technologies with some little people right in prep. We could see from prep that this literacy intervention was going to be arduous and it was going to be the long haul. So we started to introduce iPads. Um, we had a program we were using called Clicker Sentences where the young person could have the sentences read to them and they could drag different words into the sentences and they were able to respond and um, write stories. Uh, we were using speech to text and text to speech right from the beginning, not with all. There were some young people we could certainly catch up, but we found that it wasn't a really quick fix and it was really hard work um, for the young person, for the teachers, for the support staff. It wasn't it wasn't just a, a quick overnight fix. So we were finding that the earlier we introduced it, the the you know, the better the young people were sort of by the time they got to mid primary. So they were still on that literacy intervention, but we noticed that they were able to access the curriculum much better, you know, as that as they entered into primary school. So that's kind of where I really started. So we had lots of different programs um, that we were using. I won't name them because they're obviously still in use, but, um, you know, we had speech to text to speech. We had a great program I was using in the upper primary and in the, in the secondary school that was uploaded onto computers and the young people were able to summarise information. They were able to get key points. It, you know, it obviously had spell check. It had um, text to speech, all of those sorts of things. So we were using a bright, you know, we had um, applications that could scan text and read back to the young person. We were teaching dictation as well. That was interesting. <laughs> and again, that really relied on the technology as well. And it, you know, again, it looked like a quick fix, but it wasn't always. Sometimes it was more frustrating than than actually helpful. So I've used a lot of different <laughs> different types of assistive technology. We ha we've had ex assistive technology consultants come into our school and, and, and consult with us and teach us. So yeah, I've spent, you know, it's probably at least the last 15 years trying out a lot of different types of <laughs> technologies in schools to help young people. So um, that's probably why I'm quite excited about the opportunities that AI present now. <laughs> well, I'm guessing too, in, in hearing you reflect and recount on that, I think there's also a real awareness that nothing is going to be a silver bullet and that, you know, this process of experimentation is a necessity, um, you know, and I, I think understanding that it's not necessarily just the tool, it really is about the craft and the implementation. You know, you can have um, a gigantic budget and be in this situation where any tool you want, you can purchase it. But if you haven't done that thoughtful training and thinking about matching with pedagogy, the tool's not really going to, you know, do what it mm. can. Uh, the analogy I often give is uh, my father has has gifted my wife and I a lot of his tools. He's stopped his like woodworking and is slowing down with fixing things around the house. <laughs> and so he's gifted me this huge bundle of tools. But you know, that does not necessarily mean I am going to be a yeah. carpenter <laughs> overnight just because I have mm. them. So when you say that you're excited or you feel like, you know, you can see the potential for AI, um, is there something that you're thinking, yes, and like, here's what I, I think we need to be mindful of when we are experimenting with this technology? Or again, I, I find there are still so many folks that are maybe hesitant to do that ex experimentation. So do you have a thought in terms of what it means just to get started to try out the tool or why the trying out is going to be a part of the learning? That's such a great question. Um, I love that analogy about the tools too. I'm going to, I'm going to steal that from you. <laughs> That's a great one. <laughs> one of the big, I'm just going to go back to when I was working in schools. One of, and uh, just so you know, I'm, I'm working in the private sector now. I've only been out of schools for three years, so it's still pretty current, but, um, and I've certainly worked uh, alongside them as well and with, with school age children. One of the massive challenges we had was the uptake, particularly as the young people, um, got into secondary education, you know, you'd be sort of, our upper primary school and then into into high school, um, it was embarrassing. Nobody wanted to be seen to be using anything different 
than anybody else was, you know, were using in the classroom in terms of. So I had some incredible teachers who were just working and, and assistants who were working so hard to get this up and running. We had extensive training. Um, so we were training in the tools. Um, like I said, we had consultants out, I had whole staff training, I had um, our assistant staff training. I trained the young people. We actually had um, focus training sessions. I work, we all work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then they'd go in the classroom and they didn't want to use it because nobody else was using it beside them. So, <laughs> you know, it was really interesting that so, and uh, relating that to AI, something, and look, and I'm just talking about the young people. So I work with children, teens and young adults. Who, are, who identify as neurodivergent. Most of them are all have a diagnosis of autism. And it's really interesting that you talk about, um, you know, the, I guess the the mindset around that is I've noticed that the the young adults who I've been talking with about assistive, assistive technology, they're really hesitant. And I think some of them are at university, some of them are in the senior phase of their education, and they're really, and, you know, I guess they're rules-based as well. And so they're really hesitant about about you and quite, yeah, some of them don't want to know about it. Um, and I've actually got a couple of young people who are studying IT at university, but don't really want to know about how we can use the AI for functional or social reasons. And um, yeah, they're quite worried about breaking the rules and getting caught around plagiarism. Um, they're worried about getting caught down that deep dark hole of, um, you know, doom scrolling or getting, you know, addicted to tech, you know, so they're quite conscious of that. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a slow burner. <laughs> you know, I get, I, I've almost found like my generation, I'm Generation X, I've found like we've sort of come, to, you know, some people I know have come to it really enthusiastically, whereas our younger people are a little bit, don't know, yeah, they're, and, and I'm not sure whether that's because all we hear is the, the worst case scenario, and there are some horrific worst case scenarios we know with um, lots of AI and deep fakes and things, but we're not hearing the good stuff <laughs> as well. Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up because a, a big part of my advice has often been like, do not separate the literacies with this. You know, media literacy is going to be so important with AI literacy. And I actually have a, a big component of a, a certain workshop I give just looks at the marketing of different tools and also some of the sensationalism in the reporting about AI. And as you mentioned, we always hear about the worst case scenarios. And I would say like, this is true of all technology, you know, snowblowers included, like we've all heard the horror stories, but you know, it doesn't necessarily make the news when everyone on my street has a snowblower, it worked well, their driveways are safer, right? Um, and why that's not headline news. So it's it's so important to be talking about those things. And coming back to what you said about the experimentation, uh, this is where over the summer, I've actually been working with some pre-service teachers. And I, I actually had a little part where we just look at uh, how the media has informed the way that we think about bots, both chatbots and, and robots, and looking at um, everything from movie trailers to song lyrics, because there is this big conversation in popular culture about these things too, and thinking about, but how does that inform the way that we mm. think about this? But I've also just been kind of dropping these little moments and opportunities for the students to see how it might be an <laughs> asset. So it's not a must mm -hmm. have, but it's sort of a, a scaffold. Um, and we were we were doing the um, question formation strategy. And it was, you had the opportunity, like either you could be generating questions on your own or in the slide, I had a little, or click the bot for help where I leave the prompt that I have and I ask the you know chat bot to take on the role of my student's age and, and I give it the context and I say, just give me three starter mm -hmm. responses to this. So it's sort of a, you know, you're stuck, you need some help, it's there if you want it, it's not there if you don't want it. And at the end of the activity, I always have students reflect on, if you use the help, was it an asset or a distraction? And now, actually, if you click on the help, would it have been useful or not? Because um, I think when we're in this place currently of, I'm not sure how this would help, we have to provide those experiences, you know? Um, just like with the toolbox analogy, the physical, you know, like hammers and drills, I'm never actually going to know 
what they can do until I have a situation where I'm going to use that hammer, right? Fiona, I'll be sure to link to this in the show notes. You've written about the potential social, social uses for AI with neurodivergent learners. And um, again, like this is that situation where I feel like people need to hear some stories, hear some examples to get it. Can you walk us through a use case that maybe is not necessarily about the academics, but is about uh, friendship dynamics or social emotional learning? Exactly what you, it's interesting what you were just saying as well. I, a couple of things. I am using it in the terms of not just shoving it down your face and this is how you should all be using it. It's more about, you know, is there a blocker? Can at least just get you started? It's not about giving you all the answers. It's not about, you know, robbing you of ideas and creativity. It's just sometimes maybe to give you a little shove to get you started. That's kind of how, I, you know, similar to what you're saying as well. I love, um, something I'm not doing that I thought was really great that you just said is is, is um, getting them to reflect on it afterwards. That's such a great idea. And something else you, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit, but something else you talked about as well as, um, again, when I was using the assistive technology in schools, um, and I can't remember the, the data now, but high, high percentage in terms of digital literacies, um, you know, we were finding that young people were were starting secondary school and all of a sudden, you know, we've got laptops and all sorts of things. They could all scroll, that, that you know, they can all, you know, use Snapchat beautifully, but they didn't know how to open a Word document or a folder, <laughs> um, or, you know, or save something. And we were spending six months of the year teaching just basic digital literacy. So, um, you know, and it's, it's similar to this as well. It's just kind of just... Um, dropping the seed and drip feeding, I think, in really functional kind of ways. So um, you were asking about and exactly something else you were saying as well as you're just sort of finding teachable moments. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I don't have an actual class where I'm saying, okay, we're all coming over to, to learn about AI. I'm just dropping it into teachable moments. And some of my staff are as well. I've got an occupational therapist um, as part of our team and she is and we've been talking about how we can just sort of gradually introduce it not not shove it down their throats so um, I guess a good example would be just last Friday so I had um, a young adult group and we were um, doing some creative thinking games and I was using chat G G T chat GPT to start some some silly st story starters and we were sitting around just talking and one fellow mentioned how they're about to go to Japan. It's the first time he's traveling overseas. It's the first time he's been in a plane. Um, and he was really quite worried about it. And um, so, and hey, let's have a, and I had it up on, on the screen. Let's have a go and, and just put this in. And so, you know, such and such is worried about going to Japan, anxious about the flight. Um, we put a few specifics about him personally um, that he likes to do, things that he's particularly worried about do you have some strategies and he just came up with all of these amazing strategies and then you just but then you know the more you use it the more you understand how to fine tune it and the more intuitive you become and it becomes and then we started to say are there any apps that would be helpful and you know it said trip it app would be helpful to plan and calm app would be helpful if you're feeling stressed da, 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 da. you know and, and a few of them were like me i don't know about that and he but he was yeah he was quite interested and his mum then emailed me later to sort of say you know he was chatting about some of the things that came up so it was just about drip feeding as well you know in that conversation another young person um you know can get really socially exhausted quite quickly and you know we're really in, we're, we're helping our young people to make informed friends and um you know to consolidate friendships you know via getting together with one another um, and they've made a friend with this young person who wants to catch up in a group context so they want to catch up with this young person but they don't want the, the group context is just a bit overwhelming at the moment so we and that this person had texted them and so we said um let's put that in as well you know how do I I can't remember what we said, but um, give me a text where I've been invited to a group catch up. I really want to catch up with the person, but I don't want to catch up in a group context. And it came up with this amazing text, you know, you know, hi, I've, you know, it's really great to hear from you. I'd really love to catch up. I'm sorry, I can't make it to Saturday, but how about next week? Blah, blah, blah. So, um, and we, you know, and then I showed them how you can, some of them are a bit sceptical, so we tweaked it a little bit, uh, just just little things like that, just dropping it into the moment when you can. So 
that yeah that that was just a recent example the the scenario piece i think is huge and that is the one that i find gets most people really excited um you know that exact scenario that you just mentioned where i know this is coming up like i kind of would love to have some you know preparation or something that can help me kind of script or even imagine what that's going to be like um i've created a few little mega prompts that will generate a scenario with a dialogue and with some reflective questions that can then be brought to groups. And it was really interesting because the first time I modeled this, a bunch of teachers said, actually, it might be really interesting for us to do this with some of our conflict navigation stuff. So, you know, because, and this is where I think when we're talking about neurodiversity, everyone thinks differently, right? Um, and I, I find this is when we're talking about accommodations, it benefits everyone. Um, I, I have yet to come across someone who, you know, really loves yeah. conflict, who would say like, <laughs> I am 100% comfortable in conflict, right? I, I mm -hmm. have not come across that person. Um, and so I, I think for going through a scenario with some options and doing some of that perspective switching, it can be really interesting. And I love that you said, you know, some of your students also had some skepticism mm. or were like, no, that's not quite <laughs> right. Because you have the power to engage with feedback and revise mm -hmm. and tweak. And I always like to remind folks, do you know what that is? That's teaching writing. Mm. You know, um, I, I, I feel like the, the art of revision, we have this completely different modality in which to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I find when they are these really kind of personalized scenarios, it's not as much of a challenge to get students talking about it, to get them interested in doing the analysis, because it's also kind of about mm. us. So there's a, there's a lot to tap into with that. Um, and I would also say, I think doing what you did and having your students kind of critique the advice is very important mm -hmm. because Fiona, I'm seeing at like this very fast rate, everything is going to have a built in bot if it doesn't already. Um, and I think to the extent that, you know, all of us are going to have to get better about critiquing the information that were given to us from a bot. Um, I know of so many students who have said, yeah, I'm trying to work out either friendship issues or I'm kind of asking questions that I would have asked a therapist. I'm bringing this to a chat bot now. And I kind of think this is, again, that information literacy of you have to understand not to take that advice um, without really thinking critically about what it's saying um, and maybe why it's saying too. Thank you for tuning in to Shifting Schools. Let's pause our discussion to spotlight Libra HQ, a breakthrough in using AI to deepen connections within organizations. Imagine an environment where every staff member feels truly seen and valued. This is the heart of Libra's mission. Libra transforms how leaders celebrate and recognize the personal and professional milestones of their team members. It's not just about reminders. Libra's AI dives deeper, offering insight into enhanced team cohesion and promote a culture where support and acknowledgement are paramount. Picture a school where every individual is acknowledged, from work achievements to personal victories, creating a culture of appreciation in just minutes a day. In these challenging times, where the demands on educators have never been higher, Libra offers a way for school leaders to lead with true empathy and compassion, ensuring every team member feels an integral part of their community's success. Discover how Libra can revolutionize your school's culture. For a demo, contact me at jeff at shiftingschools.com. Let's build a future where every educator and staff member feels connected and valued. And now, let's get back to our conversation. You've described yourself as cautiously optimistic when it comes to AI. Um, let's talk more about the cautious optimism, what that mindset, mindset might kind of look or sound like in practice. I, I guess I'm the same, you know, uh, we're on the same as everybody else. You know, I get worried about, yeah, about uh, particularly the creative, the ability to be able to, you know, to, to generate creative responses and even images and, uh, you know, the same as everybody, you know, concerned about what AI is going to do to our workforce as well, you know, and I, and because I work with 
some young young people who have um, learning differences or intellectual disability, and I can see that there are jobs that are being replaced by AI that typically might be really suited to those young people as well. You know, there are some, you know, I guess, you know, AI can often be sold by let's take, you know, let's take repetitive tasks away and, and replace them with, with robots or, or whatever. Um, but there's some people who love that as well. Um, so I guess that's where the, the you know, I, I can get cautious about it as well you know and I know there's lots of really insidious um, things that are happening but I guess I just reflect that's happened in um, humanity since time began I'm not really sure how different we are now and um, so I think we probably just really do need to focus on that functionality and you know like you and I both saying just drop it into little functional moments teachable moments in because we're really in terms of the young people the only sort of exposure they're getting a lot of the time to you know, the potential of AI is around academia you know how it can structure your assignment and how it can paraphrase and how it can do dot points or start your abstract or whatever it is you know all of those sorts of things but there's so many great other applications you know another another couple of examples that we've just used recently another young person was writing an email that was a little bit difficult and we just asked it to write it in a friendly yet firm tone and it just it just tweaked a few different words and it changed the tone of the, of the email that landed a lot a lot better um you know like I, I was explaining our ot our occupational therapist at the moment she's using it she's doing a a cooking class with a small group of of young people and um one young lady has dyslexia another young lady has significant fatigue issues another young lady has some mobility challenges and another one has quite significant um, eating preferences. <laughs> so trying to find a menu that they're going to cook as a small group has been really interesting. We've we've gone to AI and with them, you know, we've had it up on the screen. And, you know, when you're doing it collaboratively, you get more buy-in, particularly with teens, you get, you're going to get buy-in. Um, and so we've just become really specific about putting, we would like a recipe for four people within this budget that doesn't have quinoa and blah, blah, and whatever <laughs> they, uh, you know, um, that's not too spicy, that's gluten-free, that's, you know, and, um, and it'll come up with something, say, you know, no, I don't like coriander, and it'll come up with something else. And it's just kind of learning how to tweak it. Now give that to me in clear steps that I can tick off. Um, now give that to me in clear language. You know, you can, just, you can just tweak it. You just get so much better at it when you're using it for functional reasons. And I guess it's just being with the young person to, to support them to do that and just finding those moments. Is, is going to be really important for us, I think, to, to help them understand that it can be a, a help, not a not a big scary thing as well. It's been with us for a long time anyway, <laughs> so it was just probably in our face now. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and I, I take your point too about this is part of the, the technology cycle, right? There's a new technology and I think there is often a very real concerns, things to watch out for, and very real benefits. Like it's always kind of a balance. I don't think AI is different in that. Um, and and for me, it's how can we seek out that balance, continue to do the research, um, continue to be looking for if my opinion is grounded in this, am I still kind of testing it a little bit? Because um, I, I agree with you. I, I would say maybe like a year ago, the creativity one was something like I was thinking about, especially artists. I was very worried and concerned about them. And so that's been like a little bit of a research wormhole that I've gone down. And I've come across a musician called Holly Herden, who is an electronic musician who's got um, a computer science background out of Stanford. And what she has done is she has decided to design her own large language models, pumping it full of her own content. And she's kind of created like her own bot and has decided to make it open source for any other musicians. So she makes this generative music, but it's fed on her as a musician. Uh, there's a wonderful interview where she talks about how she thinks, um, you know, this kind of technology is going to give more folks access to experimenting with music, which I mm. think is kind of cool. But I would say, you know, my my learning around so much of this for me, it's really been about my own network. And Fiona, like I came across you on mm -hmm. LinkedIn and I'm finding, you know, I, I try to share as often as I can things that I'm trying out in that space. 
And it's really fascinating. You know, as we talked about earlier, I think there is a hesitation right now. Something is so new. So many of us, I think, are afraid of, you know, admitting to not knowing mm. how to or, oosh, I should have done this mm. better or use that tool. Um, and so often folks will send me like a, a private message rather than a comment. And just today, actually, I, I posted, I've been like really into gardening. And um, so I just took a picture of, you know, those little like uh, posts that go into new plants when you buy them that tells you the scientific name and all that. I just took a picture of I bought five different plants and it was a lengthy prompt, but more or less, I just basically said, you know, give me a concept for how I should plant these with aesthetics <laughs> in mind. And also I really want to attract pollinators. And, you know, like I, I am loving gardening, but there's so much about it that mm. I don't know. And in that use case, it was really interesting because it got me thinking about aesthetic design in a new way. And for me, a lot of this comes back to if I'm using this technology, do I leave the experience more curious or less? And right now I'm so interested in those use cases where people are saying, you know what, this is going to be a catalyst for more learning, not necessarily a container. Um, and so, I, but again, it's been, I think, sharing those stories with one another and looking for more stories is just super important right now. So, I mean, you know, I want to thank you for being engaged in that conversation. And I, I wonder if in closing, when you're thinking about your own network or conversations that you're having even face to face with people, what's a conversation around AI that you'd love to just sort of see more of, or a question that you wish more of our colleagues and, and peers were considering. They don't necessarily have to be able to answer it, but they're just asking the question. Mm, that's a that's a great question. A couple of things from what you just said. I think it's, you know, my years with using assistive technology again in schools, the big lesson I learned was, you know, there were so many things, so many applications that we could be using. Just choose your one or two and just, you know, choose your, your, your one or two priorities and get really good at those because a new one's going to come, come along. I mean, I, I, I don't know the statistics. I know it used to be about 35,000 apps were released a day. I'm sure it's millions now. That, that's a really old, old one. So I guess it's just about picking your one or two and just, just going steady, steady. And I've found that with AI as well. You know, when you approached me to do this podcast, I thought, oh my goodness, I don't know every single AI that I could be possibly using. And I thought, you know what? Nobody does. And it's just about what I personally do in my little tiny world. So I guess in terms of, you know, and, and I guess in terms of helping our young people um, not, you know, find, believe in the functionality of it, it's helping them understand their digital diet as well. Um, you know, we have a choice of whether we want to eat Maccas all day and every day or whether we want to have some fruit and veggies and, and you know, <laughs> a balanced diet. So, and it's it's quite similar as well. So, it's around education. So, I guess in terms of the the questions around um, professionals was, would just be to be curious, just to be curious and to, um, and probably just step aside, because it's really, the, the how it can be um, helpful for academics is is pretty easy. I mean, that's that's really you know. I, I guess for for you and I who work in education, you know, it's it the applications for that is is just so once you have have a little bit of a dabble, you very quickly work out how you you know differentiation and um, all sorts of things in terms of an education context. But I'm not sure if professionals are looking at it from that social emotional functionality context as well or you know in schools in particular um, we're dealing with a breadth of of young people who we have in any one classroom so you might you know we have so many learning differences we have um, neurodivergence we have disability we have all sorts of young people in our classroom um, how can you use it for functional reasons to help those young people in you know specifically for their you know individual profile as well without getting yourself overwhelmed so i guess it's just about being really curious you know there's a there's a fellow here in um and i would really encourage people to to look this up there's a website called universal sandpit and he is an educator here in australia and his his website is is free and he's got and he's very much into into ai and he has been for a quite a long time and he, he runs different webinars. I have no affiliation with him, by the way. I just follow all his work. It's great. Um, but he's got these beautiful uh, tabs where 
um, you can put in a topic and you can get a whole UDL schema for how you might be able to prepare for a topic or for a unit that you're teaching. You know, he's got social scripts, he's got tabs where you can break down assignments, tabs for task analysis, tabs for differentiation. And, you know, he can, and, you know, I get onto his website fairly regularly and there's always a new tab. He's just constantly being curious. So I guess it's just, I guess, uh, um, be discerning about our, our professional diet as well as you know looking at the people who are using it well and optimistically and because it's here it's not going to go and it's it's polarizing it's going to either be people who do use it and don't use it so I guess it's about looking at professional diet too who who are you going to learn from and I guess be curious and have keep those conversations open would be probably yeah where, where you know my standpoint in terms of how we continue to learn and grow with this yeah, I, I love that. And I think that can even be, you know, curiosity about your own opinion, even if, you know, you're in an environment where this is not a hot topic. Um, you know, I, it's interesting to me. Sometimes I speak with people and they're like, actually, we're not really chatting about it. So if, if that is your context, um, you know, an example that I give, as I mentioned earlier, I take people through this, um, this specific kind of thing that I've created that helps us decode the marketing for a lot of these different AI products. And uh, about nine months ago, I did this with a product that's called Zuolinguo. It's, um, it's working on animal communication. The marketing of it is really interesting. And for anyone that uh, loves cats and dogs, it really like needles you a little bit in terms of like, you're going to want to spend money on this because you're going to want to be able to communicate with your animal better. Um, and so I led this group conversation around, you know, like how many of us, you know, live with a dog or a cat, lots of hands went up. And I kind of gave the story about how actually, uh, you know, my dog, I feel like we've got a great repertoire. Like we really often know like what one another is feeling or, or kind of thinking, um, and so I had kind of said, you know, to what extent actually is this really going to solve a real problem? You know, I, I, I always push people to be looking at these tools. What is the problem they're purporting to be able to solve? And is it an important problem? How do we know? Because at that point, Fiona, I thought, this is not a pressing concern. I was wrong. Mm. I continued to learn about what AI is trying to do in terms of animal communication and the more and more that I've learned about it, it's fascinating because there are some scientists who are thinking, if we get this right, this might be what nudges folks to go to more of a sustainable diet. If you know we're able to communicate better with animals, might more of us decide to become vegetarians? Uh, might more of us decide to take better care of the planet? And so they were walking through these greater ramifications. And I was like, my goodness, yeah, that's right. That might have much, much bigger implications than me asking my dog, do you want to play with this ball or that ball? Which, by the way, she there really is one ball. She always tells me that she wants to play with anyway. Um, so that that curiosity is huge, right? Are you also a human to a dog? Yes. Oh, oh goodness. Yes, I am. And we think we know what he's saying, but, you know, there's... <laughs> He tips his head and it'd be nice to know what he's really thinking or maybe not. Uh, in, that's really interesting. I haven't heard of that. But I'm, and again, I guess when we're working with other professionals, talking to lots of different di professionals as well and because we all have a different angle because when you were describing that, what was going through my mind was, you know, I'm in the business of helping young people make and keep friends with with like-minded people and we've got a lot of young people um, who have a special interest in cats in particular. And we're often looking for, you know, what's, you know, okay, so you've both got a special interest in cats. What's something you can do where you can get together around cats, you know, and it, sometimes it can be a bit tricky, you know, look at cat books or talk about cats or look at my cat photos or, you know, our cats don't really play together. So sometimes, so as soon as you're saying that, I was thinking, oh my goodness, that's something that they could be doing when they're getting together. And so that's a, a social that's a social opportunity for young people or anybody who has an interest in cats and they, they found somebody. Oh, 100%. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's interesting. Yes. We all kind of talk to different people and we all come, come with a completely different lens. So it's got multiple applications. <laughs> so, hmm. Yeah. Well, this is uh, that, you know, I do a lot of work with media literacy and everybody talks about it has to be interdisciplinary. The same thing I think is true of AI. So it's a great time for us to get out of any container real or imagined and just chat with more people 
Fiona, I'm really happy to have been able to have chatted with you today. So uh, listeners, please, sure, please, please do head over to the show notes, learn more about connecting with Fiona, the, uh, the, the written work that I mentioned as well, and her website. Thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise Thanks, with Thanks, Richard. Us. It's been an absolute pleasure.